when they're printing money, what happens is, you know, the financial class will just go out and buy more, more assets. An example of that would be, what was it, that hedge fund called BlackRock? They took $6 billion of cheap money. They bought single family homes um, and then they rented those homes out. And so we, we turn into a, a, a renter society. You know, basically you will own nothing and you will be happy is was one of the messages at the World Economic Forum. In other words, the financial class wants to expand at the expense of the middle class and, and, the, and the poor. And so money printing accelerates that. It continues to accelerate that. So the homelessness problem has everything to do with our broken monetary system. And uh, these people in the financial class, it's very convenient for them not to understand this. And it is the root problem that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote about in, in the post in 2009. This is what Bitcoin is all about. It's about decentralization so that you can't print. Uh, you, the Fed cannot print energy. They can't print Bitcoin. There is a proof of work tethered to Bitcoin. Welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner podcast, where we explore the intersection of Bitcoin and progressive issues. I'm your host, Mark Stefani. My guest today is Brian Solston. Brian is a software developer, U.S. patent agent, and aerospace propulsion engineer. He is now running for U.S. Senate for the state of Washington on a platform focused on Bitcoin and STEM. It is also evident that Brian is committed to the support of the LGBTQ community, and as you will see, his passion for these causes is quite clear. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode with Brian Solston. Here we are. Brian Solston, thank you so much for joining me on the Progressive Bitcoiner podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure being here. Thank you. So having read your book, Zenimal, you clearly have a unique uh, and intriguing arc for your, both your personal and professional life. And I would like to focus a little bit on that arc before jumping into your political aspirations and campaign platform in Bitcoin. So in your book, uh, you describe the transition while being a member of the, the Mormon church of, quote, worshiping hierarchy. And then also this consideration of outsiders being, quote, less than others. I'm wondering how that value system has changed over time and what was the impetus for that change? Oh, that's that's a long transition, but I think it's common amongst, you know, people whether you're being raised in, you know, as a Catholic or a Mormon or, you know, other religions, there's there's often, you know, let's say a an education or indoctrination into hierarchy. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about the songs or looking at the architecture or a lot of the other symbolic language. It's it's supporting the hierarchy. And if you do that, then, you know, you're a good person. And, uh, you know, like, for example, Judaism, you have the Gentiles, you know, it's us and them. And in, in Mormonism, it's it's no different. In fact, they use the same vocabulary that the that's in the Old Testament. So that was my view. And uh, I very much remember that being raised that way. So let's just say that uh, my family upbringing was, let's say, more orthodox than general. Uh, my father was rather secular, and uh, he and I started to talk a lot when we were when I was older, and so that kind of set me up for the transition. But it wasn't until I started, you know, going to uh, BYU and getting exposed to and reading books that I really started to see other perspectives in, in, in life. Especially when you, when I traveled to the Middle East, that was one of the uh, transformative times in my life. But uh, if I can, I can t- let me talk about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and, and Lila. That, to me, was, was influential. Rather than looking at everything in terms of the objective and subjective and right and wrong, you know, Lila gets into patterns of value and it has a lot of overlap with the scientific method. You, you have choices. Here's a pattern of value. There's a pattern of value. Well, I want to be outside. So I get up and, and go outside just because that pattern of value is for me at that time, my choice, I think it's better. So it's it's just kind of a comparison of two different patterns of value that we're constantly doing. And I think that's a better model for most of the things that are happening in, in you know, day-to-day stuff uh, in, 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 instead of this, you know, this big theatric uh, drama of good versus evil. 
And so what were the other takeaways uh, that you had from both Zen and the Art of the Motorcycle Maintenance and uh, Lila for as being formative books for you? It sounded like they were really a transition point that led that pointed you in the direction of uh, meditation specifically. Yeah, exactly. And, and eventually Bitcoin. And that's, you know, that's what I tried to capture in, in, in my, my book, Zenimal, is I, I wanted to capture that, that character arc of going through, you know, meditation and understanding consensus and getting into the macro consensus of Bitcoin. But really, um, that's where I ended up. But, but the point is, is, at the very beginning, it was all these little things that bled into each other. For example, Zen is, let's say, less hierarchical. It's more, uh, it's, it's a flatter way of looking at things, right? It's, you could call it peer-to-peer in a lot of ways, but it's really not that either because meditation is really what Zen is. That's it. Everything else perhaps is a corruption. And so the idea of just sitting there and being able to listen to your own noisy mind uh, is, is meditation. So getting comfortable with these, these, um, you know, just building, let's say, consensus within your own mind, you know, achieving some level of congruency, it's a good thing. And it takes time, you know, going through those education cycles, whether it's yourself or a group of people, it's the same issue. And even the macro consensus with Bitcoin, that's effectively what you're doing with Bitcoin. And, um, you know, that's the accomplishment. And if you can do it without an intermediary, wow, that, that was the breakthrough in October 31st, 2008 with the white paper was you, you can do this without an in, in intermediary. And I think Zen has an overlap with that, is that, you know, you really don't need all this hierarchy. And in my early engineering years, um, I was bumping into this concept a lot. Uh, I, you know, the world is flat. Um, there was a book out on that. And, and I thought we were heading towards that. that you know, the, the internet is decentralized. The TCP IP is decentralized. So I'm thinking, wow, we're really going to, move towards a flatter future in terms of these structures. And I was excited about that. And I joined a, a search engine company before Google was around. And, you know, I was super excited about that. One of the, let's say, one mo- moment in my life where it was kind of like, wow. I, I was with a roommate and he, he actually started the search engine company um, called Folio, which was, a, you know, eventually bought by Microsoft and effectively buried, but um, but it, at that time he had the best technology for you know those these old three eighty six um, PCs personal computers for searching large reference, and we were just I was in his bedroom and he was showing me what his technology was and how the indexing worked, and the wow moment was the index was completely flat. It wasn't a big hierarchy. It wasn't this complicated tax taxonomy. And it was just almost immediate, the results. And he would just type in something and things came up. You know, people look at that today and like, oh, no big deal. At that time, it, I'd never seen anything like it. At the, the speed he was doing on a personal computer. And, you know, I've seen some of it a little bit on, on, on mainframes at that time. But it was always dealing with some kind of crazy taxonomy and, you know, library system. And it just, you couldn't go where you wanted immediately. And this is the paradigm of the future where computers are doing the thinking, whereas people, they they have to break things down. They have to do this, you know, huge breakdown and categorize everything to, to make sense of it all. Um, you know, they, so we're constantly doing these decompositions of complicated t- taxonomies. And here, the future of computing is, you know, let's, let's call it kind of like a graph database. You know, it's just very flat. And uh, I, I was excited at that moment. And we, we still have a long ways to get there. But I, I, I believe that one little paradigm was I didn't worship hierarchies like I did in the past after that moment. As we get into your journey into the running for U.S. Senate and Bitcoin, one of the comments that have, you've received uh, from former uh, colleague, uh, and I'll quote here specifically, says that of all the people I've worked with in the last couple of decades in many different types of businesses, Brian has the best strategic thinking skills of all. His ability to see a path through the most complex scenarios is amazing. I have been very fortunate to have worked closely with Brian for several years. 
obviously high praise for you. And I'm wondering, how do you think his feedback relates to how you see the future of Bitcoin, as well as how you will approach being a U.S. senator? I, th- I thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I find that science, technology, engineering, manufacturing gives me hope. You know, I, I grew up on Star Trek when I was a child. And, and to me, STEM has always offered hope in my life. And so when I study science and technology, and I've really dedicated my career to, to pursuing that, it makes me feel good. It, it gives me hope. And, uh, and Bitcoin really uh, does that for me in a big way. And so I really see Bitcoin as something that is over the horizon in terms of where we're going with this. It's, it can fix our broken monetary system. And when our monetary system is broken, everything gets broken. And that's only getting worse. And so to me, there's nothing more important than fixing our monetary system. It's what inspires me to run. And as a senator, that is going to be my focus. And that's why making Bitcoin legal tender will be my number one objective on the Senate floor. So this individual describes um, your ability to handle complex scenarios. And I think arguably uh, the more centralized uh, democratic process that we have has trouble with complex systems, that there's always externalities to laws passed. There's always a downside There's with any potential upside. How will you take that complex systems thinking uh, into being a U.S. senator? That actually relates to Zenimal and what I wrote. And, and really, let's call it the character arc, where you're going from meditation to building consensus and then learning more about the macro consensus in Bitcoin. Uh, but it's really about the education cycle. Building consensus takes time. I think the education cycle is fun. I, I enjoy it. It's fun to just relax and listen to other people. It's fun to share your pers- where they're, they're willing to listen. You can share what you've learned and try to bring things together. So as a senator, I will build consensus. And it doesn't necessarily need to be along. You know, I'm, I'm a Democrat. I don't have to work only with Democrats. Any Bitcoiner, whether Republican or Democrat, is going to be part of my consensus building my education cycle, and we will reach out to other people who want to learn, staff members or, or other senators. So yeah, that's, that's, my, that's how I'm going to operate. And, um, and being able to, let's say, break through all this complexity and build a, a strategic vision really requires going through that education cycle with my colleagues, being respectful. I, 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 I'm not I'm not part of that toxic frequency. You'll notice one thing about uh, about Seattle. Um, we really different. We do have a different frequency up here, and we have a lot of respect for diversity. Uh, for example, a lot of the natives around here weren't forced to walk on a trail of tears. There was there was uh, common respect for for Native Americans early on. That has we we've continued that spirit. And, uh, and of course, of course, there were some injustices, but I want to say to the degree that you see in other parts of the United States. Moving on to your, your campaign and more your, your political aspirations here, you've described yourself as a social liberal. What does that mean? I think there's really two things that define a social liberal, liberal in today's context. And uh, I would say that that's, you know, for me, I just call it queer rights and, and pro-choice. and. Uh, Rather than saying LGBTQ, I say queer rights. And the reason why is because that's broader. I, I just want to say it, it, it's more than sexuality. It's okay to be different. And so that's why I say queer rights. It's, it's, it's a bigger umbrella. And, um, and I kind of hate reducing everything to sexuality. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just so, you know, chimpanzee politics, you know, being obsessed with hierarchy and sexual privilege. You know, it's just, it is, we can kind of grow beyond that. And so... Queer rights and pro-choice, I think, is are the two two defining variables of of what a social liberal is, and let's not conflate that with with fiscal conservative. Another thing is individual sovereignty. That's something that I strongly believe in. That's something that you know, in my formative years, I was I was into you know Zen and art and the motorcycle maintenance. I was into Lilla. I was reading books like uh, The World Is Flat, which came later. 
But, um, you know, as far as the, the, in, the sovereign individual, I don't think I read that when I was younger. I read it, you know, just recently or listened to the audiobook. But I know I was talking to friends who had read it. And a lot of that thinking influenced my, my thinking. So individual sovereignty is, uh, I believe, is social liberal. Now, conservatives will say, no, that's, that's conservative. Well, truthfully, neither of us have a monopoly on sovereign individuality or sovereign individual. But to me, that is synonymous with queer rights. So, um, that, and that gets into a big topic. I'm also a privacy advocate. It, it all blends together. Um, if I can digress just a little bit, like, for example, I think queer rights and individual sovereignty are almost synonymous. Uh, for example, uh, Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple. You know, he's gay. And I think the reason why Apple has really good privacy is because he's very sensitive to private information being taken and used against the gay community around the world. So that's why that's why uh, he's sensitive to this topic. And he doesn't allow uh, U.S. government just to come and take information. He'll put up a fight. And he, he's proven that multiple times where, where he is a privacy advocate. And again, that's why I'm a privacy advocate. I am a social liberal. I believe I believe that being social liberal is about individual sovereignty. I believe it's about queer rights. And also, I'm going to throw in something a little more controversial, but I'm also pro-choice. So in addition to those elements, and obviously Bitcoin, it looks like you're also advocating for uh, STEM education on your, your platform. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and also how you see that uh, disincentivized within our current uh, monetary and fiscal policy? Well, you know, um, STEM is something that I have pursued for multiple decades now. Um, science, technology, engineering, manufacturing. This is where we get real progress. And sometimes when we talk about, let's say, being progressive, and, and that can mean many things. Um, before somebody says, are you progressive? You kind of have to well, define what is progressive. And, uh, you know, just as far as taking wealth and redistributing it uh, doesn't necessarily accomplish much. But one thing that does create more wealth is science, new technology, improved engineering, improved manufacturing. This is where we're, we're creating wealth. And this is, ex this is accelerating at, at an accelerated rate. And let me, let, me, uh, let me kind of digress again. Um, I, I want to call this my, let's, let's call it my, my broken record. You know, the loop that we often have deep down inside. It's that loose tooth you keep playing with. Uh, one of my struggles in life is I've always had this thought, okay, I'm an engineer. I'm working hard. I'm specializing in this or that to try to make greater efficiency. And a lot of, a lot of engineers and technologists and scientists, manufacturing, we're all doing that. But then, you know, we, we get more efficiency, we get progress. And then later on, humanity fills the gap and the human condition is the same. In fact, it's actually bigger. You know, 200 years ago, there was 1 billion people and now there's 8 billion people. So, so why are we improving things when you know, based on history, humanity is just gonna grow and fill the gap and make the human condition even bigger? I mean, we know technology is accelerating. We know that things are getting more efficient. So what if we do another 10x? You know, what if we have 80 billion people on this planet? Is that possible? People say, oh, no, that's not possible. Well, if you go back 200 years and you say, hey, you're going to have 8 billion people on this planet, they would say, no way. But technology has enabled it. We're enabling this, this growth. And that's my, that's my broken record. That's the thing I keep playing with. It's like, how do we stabilize? You know, how do we... What, why, why are we making all this technological progress when in actuality we're, we're actually creating this very dystopian arti artificial world that uh, may not be pleasant in the future? And I think that's why I was so attracted to Jeff Booth's book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, where he, he has, let's say, a, a slightly different broken record. Okay? He, I'm not going to speak for him what that is, but he really identifies, he's more articulate, he's got a very good book. Uh, I, I think it's better than Zenimal. I highly recommend The Price of Tomorrow. And, and he's talking about how technology is accelerating, how, you know, you fold a paper, he, he, when he's talking on his podcast, he's always talking about how you fold a paper 50 times 
how high is it going to be? Um, and nobody gets this right. But if you fold that, if you fold it once, you get two papers. You fold it again, you get four. You fold it again, you get eight, right? Just theoretically, theoretically speaking. And after 50 folds, the height of that paper goes from here to the sun. So the power of the exponent, the power of compounding, this relates to national debt, but it also relates to technology, is that we are going places that we cannot imagine. Technology is advancing very quickly. So if you don't think we can have 80 billion people on this planet, you're fooling yourself. Technology is going to enable that. So this is something that, that really concerns me. So I'm a, in other words, what I'm telling you is I'm a hardcore con conservationist. H how do we escape this, this Keynesian hyperconsumption where we're always juicing the economy, we're just grow, 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 st stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. And uh, how do we escape this, uh, where, where our savings are constantly being melted away centralized and used for stimulus, you know, more or less theft, this money printer. And it was Jeff Booth that really articulated that for me. Um, I was a big corner before I read his book, but really Jeff articulates how technology is going exponentially. And also the, the website WTFhappened.com, you know, it shows productivity. Productivity just keeps on going up. But in 1971, when we get off the gold standard, Real wages, not nominal wages, real wages just flatten out because, you know, money printing centralizes all that productivity. And how do we how do we stop that from happening? How do we stop this theft? And that's why I'm a Bitcoin. I, and that's why I believe Bitcoin is our only hope for savings and conservation, because any conservation efforts built on this broken monetary system, it's just going to be overwhelmed with this broken monetary system. It's secondary. Again, the most important thing we can do is fix this broken monetary system that we have that's only getting worse. Well, let's get into that a little bit deeper. Uh, and can you describe for us how you see Bitcoin flipping that incentive structure uh, from hyperconsumption, which we see under our current uh, policies, to savings and conservation under a more of a Bitcoin standard or Bitcoin protocol, as you call it? Yeah, I, I much prefer Bitcoin protocol because I, I look at Bitcoin as really from a technological perspective as, as opposed to the gold bug perspective. I've learned to appreciate the gold bug perspective, but that's not why I got into Bitcoin. I'm a privacy advocate. I was blown away by the encryption. But um, it's not really the person, it's the system. System, when, when you're doubling the, the, you know, the U.S. dollars in the world, you're, you're, you're inflating them. And this is the root problem that, that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote about it on a post back in either 2008, 2009, 2009, was currencies have a habit of, you know, printing more effectively. And, um, and how do we stop this problem? And fiat, fiat currency history uh, just repeats itself over. It's baked into the system. It, it, they continue to print more and more. And uh, the problem with that is when they, they devalue the currency, people know they're smart. They know they got to get rid of this cash. And so they start dumping it into homes or, you know, like in Venezuela, as soon as they get it, they're, they're buying a used car or moped or anything to get rid of it because they know it's devaluing. And so savings disappears. Conservation disappears. And what is the centralized economy do again? You know, the central bank or the Fed or the U.S. Treasury, what do they do? They start juicing the economy by printing more. Or the BIS or the World Bank, they're all doing it. They're all trying to maximize debt. And uh, in the long run, this, this only gets worse because they want to roll that debt again. How do you roll it? You print more. So how do we get out of this? Well, we need to go back to sound money principles. And this is what gold buggers really understand very well. We can't go back to the gold standard because truth is Bitcoin is superior to, to gold significantly, especially in, in the velocity of value around the world. It moves at the speed of light. So, so the transition, you know, let's talk about an example of where you have long-term horizon, where you have sound money, where people start saving. Uh, what would be an example of that? Well, before 1971, the United States was the biggest creditor nation in the world. Now we're the biggest debtor nation in the world. People did, were rewarded for savings, which is free market. Uh, the, the fact that we 
our savings has gone way down is because money is being manipulated. It is being evaporated away. And so they have to spend it quickly to to get into hard assets. So those examples of of a country or a nation or a people that have a long term horizon uh, would be like sorts. We can even go back to the 14th century during the Renaissance. And I actually wrote a paper on this. I called it trifecta, uh, something trifecta. And uh, and that was the time when they had sound money principles. They had gold. And there's they had a printing press, which was also decentralized, which displaced centralized printing of 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 uh, you know books. And those two uh, those two forces came together to really create uh, individual sovereignty, savings, long term horizon, and it was a renaissance, and a lot of wealth was generated. And I would say. A great deal of conservation was because you just didn't have to live day to day, but you, you, know, you could plant a tree for the future generation. Um, I know that's a little bit trite, but. So when you say conservation, are you referring to environmental conservation or in some other sense? Both. Um, the reason why I use conservation, um, you, you could say environmentalism. It, there's a lot of overlap. And. In, in many ways, they are synonymous. But I would su- suggest that most Democrats will use the word environmentalism, whereas Republicans will use the word conservation. And they're really slightly two different ways to approach the same problem. Um, the point is, is that we have these precious resources out there. We have clean air. We have clean soil. We have uh, clean water. And how do we how do we conserve these things? How do we protect these environmental assets? That's what I'm really talking about. That's the physical world that I'm talking about. So when I when I'm talking about conservation, uh, how how do we stabilize and protect these assets that we have? In your book, you also describe um, how U.S. debt has influenced housing prices and in turn homelessness. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and why you see it so um, well linked? Yeah, and I've you know I've had this conversations multiple times with you know outside of podcasts. This is a di- this is a difficult topic for people to get, but Bitcoiners understand this very well. Um, when they're printing money, what happens is you know the financial class will just go out and buy more more assets. An example of that would be what was it that hedge fund called BlackRock? They took six billion dollars of cheap money, they bought single family homes, um, and then they rented those homes out. And so we, we turn into a, a, a renter society. You know, basically, you will own nothing and you will be happy is, was one of the messages at the World Economic Forum. In other words, the financial class wants to expand at the expense of the middle class and, and, the, and the poor. And so money printing accelerates that. It continues to accelerate that. So the homelessness problem has everything to do with our broken monetary system. And... Uh, these people in the financial class, it's very convenient for them not to understand this. And it is the root problem that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote about in, in the post in 2009. This is what Bitcoin is all about. It's about decentralization so that you can't print. Uh, you, the Fed cannot print energy. They can't print Bitcoin. There is a proof of work tethered to Bitcoin. And, uh, and these MMT or these modern mon- monetary theory practitioners, they hate the fact that they can't print for free. They hate proof of work and they will do everything to attack it. But that is what is precious about Bitcoin and also the 21 million cap. This is what sets it apart. If we have Bitcoin, inflation disappears, gone. You know, this is going to be a transition point in history that uh, historically fiat has been, re- it was the downfall of the Roman Empire. It was, uh, you know, 14th century, we got back using gold, we had sound money, we had a renaissance. And, and then we see these 100-year cycles with fiats that end horrifically. Uh, you get into the, let's call it the, the Weimar Republic pattern. When uh, they were paying their debts, they couldn't, they printed more money, and they got into that loop. It went hyperbolic, uh, the inflation did, hyperinflation. Uh, 
you had to have a wheelbarrow of money to buy a loaf of bread. The money collapsed. More often, money just devalues forever at an accelerated rate. But when that happens, really bad things happen. Adolf Hitler came to power, and even worse things started to happen. So the point is, is that um, money printing is the root of not just evil, all evil. When the monetary system is broken, there's nothing more important than to fix the monetary problem. It's a bold statement, but uh, there's certainly a lot of historical precedents uh, to indicate as much. So I want to back up one second and get your opinion on whether or not you think a Bitcoin standard or protocol would in any way uh, limit our ability to provide some degree of social safety net? That's a very good question. Um, well, as as senator, um, you know, doing this transition is painful. And it's it we're, it's better to do a transition than to have let's call it a a, a forced function of of hyperinflation, which we're we're heading. I mean, it's baked into the system. That's where we're going. Eventually, we will go there. And I believe we need a transition. Let's call it a hydraulic effect. And and the intent is is that I mean, Senator Moore, for example. I mean, she and I are when it comes to being social liberal. I'm a social liberal. A lot of the things that she's really interested in, like prenatal care and and education, and you know, these are things that I I agree with. The difference between her and I is, you know, we're thirty trillion dollars in debt now. Thirty trillion. This is not going to be paid off. We can't pay it off. We've already passed the event horizon. We're going into the black hole. It's going to it's going to continue to compound in a way that we cannot imagine. So the the point is is that how do we get through this transition? Um, the difference between Senator Murray and myself is I, I believe in Bitcoin. I believe in the Lightning Network. And I would like to transition some of these social programs to, let's call it a LNUBI, or a universal basic income. These, these social programs are expensive. There's a lot of overhead. And we can make them a lot more efficient by just simply providing UBI to those people that are in need, even on a daily basis, and eliminate huge amounts of administrative overhead. So rather than having, you know, a thousand different programs, we can start to move towards a simplified model where we can reduce that pain of the transition from this fiat system where, you know, senators are more or less all trying to be, you know, Santa Claus and buy more votes to uh, really more of a commonwealth um, using not a CBDC. I'm strongly against using a CBDC. I will not support UBI, uh, universal basic income, with a CBDC. I will vote against it, but I will be supportive of it if it's on Lightning Network. I think it's telling when uh, your favorites. Uh, Fed Chair uh, Neil or Pre- President Neil uh, Kashkari actually puts out a symposium on how inflation is leading to wealth inequality. And yet every solution that you see is, again, simply wanting to put more money out into the system as if it's not going to lead to the same end. So Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, very novel and obviously uh, one that uh, I think I would support as well. You've described Bitcoin as ESG, not it fulfills the role of ESG, but rather Bitcoin is ESG in a quintessential, non-political, non-corruptible uh, kind of manner. Please tell us more about how you see Bitcoin as ESG. Yeah, it is ESG. You know, ESG stands for environmental, social governance. And as far as environmental, Bitcoin is our only hope for conservation and, and environmentalism. When you understand that the broken monetary system is, is juicing hyperconsumption or this Keynesian hyperconsumption, it is the problem. And so Bitcoin flips that incentive, which we already talked about. Uh, governance, Bitcoin is the most beautiful governance out there, rules without rulers. It's ultra efficient. So uh, it's a small cost as far as the proof of work which is necessary to actually stop the money printing. 
it's a small price to pay compared to, let's say, 13 different air car- carriers and their many escorts with each aircraft carrier. You know, having technology protect private property rather than aircraft carriers is a lot more efficient. So ESG, environmental, social, and governance, yeah, Bitcoin is, it is ESG. But let me kind of backtrack on ESG because ESG is a very loaded phrase. You can, you can, what is environmental? You know, how do you define environmental? I mean, anybody can write what their ideal environment is. And, uh, and so ESG is, is a phrase that I don't like. I don't like using it. it it's a fluffy word that, that allows more regulation. I mean, personally, I think fundamentally, it's not computing power that's the problem here, as in the proof of work. Um, the real problem is, is in terms of what's aggravating climate change. It, it's burning fossil fuel, and we're doing that at an accelerated rate. So uh, ESG, I think, is a distraction. It's not, it's not a good way to define what our environmental or conservation problems are. So I, I'm happy to debate with anybody if Bitcoin is ESG. I, I believe strongly it is. And also another topic, and we, we're going to be getting more um, studies on this, is how Bitcoin incentivizes uh, renewables. And it's going to be doing that at an accelerated rate. So Bitcoin proof of work is going to, I believe, enable renewables faster than government programs. Solar, by 2030, they, they won't even need government help because you know it's going down in costs on average around 15% a year. This is a megatrend. This electrification is a megatrend for the world. And, uh, and Bitcoin is going to provide incentives, you get a chicken and egg problem where, okay, we want to develop some geothermal, but we don't have a city to support it yet. So we can bring in some ASIC, you know, miners and we can start making money and develop the geothermal. And then we can organically grow the city and and pull off the ASICs, uh, miners piecemeal as demand grows organically. So in, in a scenario like that, you you wouldn't be able to develop a renewable without Bitcoin, but now we can, and we can do that all over the world. And with the combination of solar and batteries and miners as a package, that's already starting to happen. Um, you know, with Tesla and, and Blockstream, uh, this is a, this is also this is also a mega trend. And renewables are going to be accelerated because of Bitcoin. So my last few questions here. Uh, I'm curious to know, you've obviously been through a long uh, and successful career, and now you've chosen uh, to pursue a U.S. Senate seat. What keeps you motivated? Like I said, that's kind of my, let's call it my, my broken record. You know, it's, it's the thing is, ha, we, I really passionately love moving STEM forward. I'm a, I'm a STEM advocate, and technology gives me huge amounts of hope. Just like Bitcoin gives me hope. It is, Bitcoin is STEM. Bitcoin is technology. One of the most exciting technologies out there right now, as far as making big changes. So why, so the question is, why am I running for Senate? My question is, what keeps you motivated to do so? Uh, Because by accelerating STEM here in the United States, we are going to accelerate not only STEM in, in a way that that would enable, let's say, humanity to grow by a 10x in the future, where all we're doing is creating a gap. And then, you know, with Keynesian economics, we're going to juice that and then have perhaps 80 billion people on this planet. But rather, we're going to, we're going to fix the monetary system and allow people to have a long time horizon. Uh, they're going to be able to... Be, have savings. They're going to have individual sovereignty. They're going to be able to invest in their wealth rather than having it melting away. And these, this, this kind of renaissance that I think is starting to happen, thanks to Bitcoin, is going to allow us to perhaps stabilize the human condition and allow technology to build a bigger and bigger gap because people, rather than trying to, you know, safeguard their evaporating money and all these hard assets and monetizing housing and creating 
bigger homeless problems. They're going to uh, they're going to be able to get real savings and what I call real conservation. With the time that we have left, why don't you touch on not only your your book but your upcoming event that you're having as a fundraiser for your your Senate race? Yeah, this is happening very soon. It's on June fourth. Um, there's going to be room for one thousand three hundred people at the uh, Seattle Weston, only one block from from the light rail. It's a great facility, and we're going to have an afternoon of education. A really good panel. Uh, four uh, four different panels um, back to back. We're going to have a four course meal appetizer mixer, two two course meal, and then desserts after, which is going to be part of a part of a mixer there. So we're going to have um, a lot of socializing, and then in the evening we'll do a, a rally, and I'm sure we'll have a special speaker to, to do a warm up for the Brian Solston rally for U.S. Senate representing the state of Washington. Fantastic. And I will put a plug here for your book, Zenimal, Z-E-N-I-M-A-L, which is a, a combination of both Zen and minimalism. And it's a fantastic read that is a, is a beautiful blend of uh, meditation, what it means for consensus and Bitcoin. It's very uh, reminiscent of, of Jeff Booth's book. I uh, would recommend it as well. So with that, please tell the listeners where they can find you. Yeah, go to so and I. By the way, I love Jeff Booth's book, the, the Price of Tomorrow. It, it is a great book, um, and I love listening to Jeff Booth too. Uh, he, where they can find me is go to solston.org, not solstice. It's solston, s o l s t i n dot org, and that is where you will also be able to find a link for this June fourth event. Also, wonderful. Well, any any final thoughts here? Yeah, one more plug um, on. On my solston.org, you can find my Twitter account. That's really where I do all my communication. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter by going to solston.org. And from the time that I spent prepping for this interview, I can certainly tell uh, Bitcoiners who are listening to this episode that uh, Brian certainly knows his stuff and has spent a great deal of time uh, learning what Bitcoin is, uh, not only from the technological standpoint, but also obviously from its impact uh, on this world. And so somebody who's not just using Bitcoin to uh, raise funds. So we really value uh, your input in this space. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Mark.